Hi everyone, my name is Alex Jones. Welcome to Rust Operators for Kubernetes. I'm delighted to speak to you today, and it is going to be about what is Rust the programming language, why is it useful in the context of Kubernetes, what are some of the capabilities, and potentially what are some of the things it can solve. So let's dive right in. I am an engineering director at Canonical. I focus on Kubernetes, um, and I also work as a governing board member on a few open source projects that are quite popular. The latest one is Kate's GPT, which uses OpenAI's backend to help SREs debug Kubernetes issues. All that aside, let's talk about Rust. Rust is a fantastic programming language. I think that people find it a bit scary. You know, there are a lot of memes about Rust. You know, the difficulty curve is crazy. Everyone becomes either super for it or super against it. And they either try to end up writing everything in it or they never use it again. I think the reality is a little bit more in the middle of that, where Rust can effectively uplift C, C++ users in particular, but can solve some really hard problems because of its ability to be so low level. Let's talk about Rust operators in the Kubernetes context specifically. So as we look, this is a, uh, a set of uh, data that's been pulled out of the uh, state of developer ecosystem for JetBrains. AIML came at 13%, Rust at uh, 11%, of technologies for this year that are the most promising from developers. And the graph on the right shows approximately 10% of developers have touched Rust in the past 12 months, which is a trending upwards um, sort of vector. We can also pull from this in the extended version of this uh, of this data sheet and this, this report that generally speaking, Rust has increased year on year its adoption. We're seeing it used in many companies and we're seeing that Ever since its stable release in 2015, there has been generally a lot of excitement about some of the problems it can solve. Just to take you back, if you're not familiar, the history of this is that Rust was actually a personal pro project by Graydon Hoare working at Mozilla. It took a few years to build momentum until Mozilla officially sponsored Rust. And then we saw the first stable release in 2015. But the most exciting part of this is that Rust's real milestone was entering the Linux kernel, which is a real hallowed and um, challenging thing to do alongside C. So Rust is the only other language inside the Linux kernel, aside from C, which is pretty exciting. And why is that? Well, they wouldn't have put that inside the Linux kernel unless Rust actually improved upon some things. So what does it do? It has really extensive safeties around memory types and threads. How does it do that? We'll talk about that in a moment. But effectively, Rust doesn't like undefined behavior. It doesn't like you doing things that have undeterministic or unknown outcomes at both build and runtime. So you're going to hear me talking about concepts like ownership, borrowing, and scoped lifetimes. So let's dig right in to this, uh, this lovely little illustration. And you may or may not be able to see it in particularly high detail. But what I'm trying to show you here is that at the bottom of this is a main program. We're initializing an employee, and then we're finding the bonus for that employee. Um, and I have to give credit to this, this wonderful animation that was put together in the, in the link below. What you can see, though, is that the majority um, of the allocation is being done on the, th on the stack. But when we use something called a box pointer, which is a, effectively a smart auto pointer, it allows us to do heap allocation. But where it gets really interesting is you don't see us doing um, like a free, as you would in C++. The scoping does that for you. So as you descope out of the function where it was uh, initialized, you then uh, deallocate the heap memory. And this is one of the many capabilities that Rust employs to let the developer be more productive, but removing all the trappings and ceremony of C, C++. And so it really becomes kind of the middleman between the high level, higher level languages um, like Golang and those lower level languages. And so this is brilliant, how you have memory safety uh, built in. Additionally, type safety is super important. You know, everything from forcing all struct fields to be initialized to making sure that a switch or a match um, is exhaustive, so there's no dangling cases that can drop through with undefined behavior, all the way over to not having exceptions, right? And actually always returning an error that is uh, an enum, right? So as a result, just help everything work a bit better. A another example of where that's really powerful is when you're using concurrency, um, being able to use futures with uh, the, the different types of response, you can actually have control paths that are um, fully defined, right, for all the different failure modes. And lastly, I won't go through this in too much detail, but 
some of the key paradigms between the way that um, Rust has implemented its primitives for thread safety really do mean that you, you can step aside from those thorny issues around concurrency. And in fact, as you start to use Rust, although it might be a bit jarring in some of the actual implementation, the outcomes are phenomenal. Like you don't accidentally bleed or into into different state between between locks. Um, also, the ownership of an object tra transferring between um, one thread to another is it, it is passed over, and that can really make your life a lot easier. As I said, I won't go too much into detail, but again, there's a great uh, blog from when Rust came out at the bottom of the slide, which really captures um, some of those those key concepts really well. With all that said, you know, being a really safe language, there still was a very acute awareness that Rust has to woo in the C, C++ crowd, not just the cool kids and cloud native. So Rust is really two languages in one. It's got everything I've just showed you, which is the little Rust station on the left, but this thorny fellow on the right is the unsafe version of Rust. So the safe Rust and unsafe Rust. With unsafe Rust, you can scope to start using unsafe code, a little bit like C Sharp would let you use unsafe uh, a while ago. And what this means is that those programming patterns that don't necessarily fit into safe programming, so if you need to actually use a raw pointer, and do something with it, can be done in Rust. And I think this was a really intelligent quirk of the language that has allowed effectively an adoption um, journey to commence. So Rust lets you build very fast, very reliable programs. As we can see, we have a slew of service mesh distributed uh, storage, databases, web browsers, AI, ML ops platforms, and more, all using Rust. The one thing these all have in common is they're mission critical, they are low latency, and they are, need to be fault tolerant. We can even see that video games are now being produced in Rust as well. In fact, the only real incumbent to video games is that the engines need to be built, right? Unreal 4 has got you know, what, a decade in C, C++. So there is no reason why you wouldn't want to go to Rust with video games either, because it actually would be a far superior um, and a much safer way of building them. But anyway, as we continue, let's take a look at what's next. What is an operator and why Rust? That's, that's the question I think that is important. And I didn't mean to quote this with hubris here, but an operator is effectively taking all that knowledge that you've learned as an SRE or a DevOps engineer about how you manage a MySQL database or a Cassandra or something else, and codifying that into an application that governs that database or that system or those services. If you want to know more about operators, feel free to look through the CNCF's app delivery advisory group here and the white papers on it. But the definition of an operator is important because that's the focus of where we're looking to use Rust today. In terms of where we're going to use it, Let's dig into that. Most applications these days are being deployed in Kubernetes. That's a fact. You know, you have serverless, you have WASM, and Kubernetes it seem to be the, the biggest substrates out there for taking something like a, a Java or a Golang application and deploying it to the world. The reason that I think that this is particularly interesting is that Kubernetes traditionally has been exclusively Golang. It's hard to penetrate an ecosystem that is coded in a single language. And as we'll look into, there are some headwinds that are starting to show that Kubernetes itself is becoming more receptive of other languages, and in particular, system languages like Rust. One of the most popular operators I thought of when I was trying to put in my head an example of how people can sort of visualize this is Prometheus. Prometheus operator is a way of managing Prometheus. Prometheus is a monitoring tool that can be used on your computer or in Kubernetes. It, it produces metrics. And as an example, I couldn't have asked for one that's much better. The Prometheus operator will not only deploy the Prometheus server, it will not only deploy the alert manager and Grafana and other components, but it will check to see if there are changes to configuration and relate those changes, right? So this idea of um, looking at intent is quite critical to the paradigm of modern operators, especially within Kubernetes, looking at the intent within a configuration file and reconciling the intent between the actual reality of what's running. And so when we think about what does a current modern day operator look like, uh, you have to look no further than Prometheus to see a good example. So what is the state of the art in Kubernetes, right, for operators? If, if Rust is sort of emergent in that field, but Kubernetes has been around for a while, what does this all mean? Well, 
I've picked one example, right? There are many others. Operator Framework, Operator SDK, Cube Builder was the one I chose today because I think that there's a really interesting contrast between uh, the Rust-based implementations and the Golang-based. Cube Builder is a, a SIG project, so it's come out from a special interest group from Kubernetes. So a lot of experts who are working on it who help build the Kubernetes project. It lets you build operators, controllers, um, any kind of um, API that wants to work with Kubernetes. And it, again, as I said, focuses on this idea of reconciliation. So it's a loop that gets polled every so often, and you can check various resources, update, change, delete those resources. Cube Builder has been a resounding success, and I myself have also built perhaps seven to 10 projects in Cube Builder. The really great things about Cube Builder is that it's in Golang. A lot of people know Golang. It also integrates with other libraries, right? If I want to get a, a time library in Golang, I can get that. If I want to get you know, something to do compression in Golang, I can just pull it in. It's also able to generate YAML, which is quite nice, so that you can share that with a friend later on. You can say, I built a project. The image is on Docker Hub. Here's the YAML. Away you go. It's flexible. So Cube Builder actually supports the ability to um, add to Scheme so that you can add in APIs dynamically, which is specifically something that you will do if you're using custom resource definitions. And the generators um, allow you to quickly create controllers. There's some good boilerplate generators um, that let you, you know, create a file that has a bunch of stub functions, which is really nice for when you're starting out. But what are the cons? Well, Kubelder actually has a significant learning curve. Um, it takes Golang, which is a fairly simple language, and it adds a lot of constructs and abstractions on it. Uh, and it also hides a lot of the underlying Kubernetes API, so you have to go through the Cube Builder manager. There are huge amounts of code that get generated, you know, 20 to 40 files uh, per repo just on, a, on an init. There's a very large reliance on make files and customize. If you actually want to put Cube Builder into a CI CD pipeline, you need to understand how make works um, because you need to make significant changes. The comments in Cube Builder are picked up by the Go generator for doing things like RBAC in Kubernetes. So if I want to allow update on pods, I have to annotate a function inside a file and then run a generate that then spits out YAML that I then have to apply. There is no concurrency safety between controllers. So if you need to use a parameter, for example, if I've got a pod controller or a reconciler, and it's keeping a count of pods in cluster, there is zero safety um, if I want to then access that. And that's just by the nature of it not really having anything built in and um, Golang kind of leaving you um, to your own devices there. And lastly, the complex file structure makes it somewhat of a, an iceberg to crack because when you want to start using multiple versions of an API, as we'll come to, to show in a moment, um, you end up with dozens of files and also keeping those files ordered is, is a real hassle. So a real, a real bunch of pros and cons, but by no means is it a bad um, SDK, but again, it's it's a good contrast to what I want to show you today with Rust. Just to really emphasize this, this is not about Golang versus Rust. This is more about where are some of the gaps and where can we look to Rust to perhaps, in those particular scenarios, fill those gaps. There's a really nice um, article by uh, John Arundel, and I've linked to the bottom here, which really uh, encapsulates that sentiment that it's not one or the other, right? They, they are both excellent, excellent languages, um, but I think Rust is exciting in solving certain problems. So let's look at where Rust could actually help here. There is a really good Rust um, SDK called Cube Rust. Um, it's a slightly larger scope than Cube Builder, right? It's more the style of Client Go. So Client Go being the Kubernetes SDK API, it enables you to do quite a lot of extra bits and pieces um, in terms of not just creating controllers, but also expanding uh, upon that to uh, leverage the API directly. So what I mean is you can just work with Kubernetes directly through uh, KubeRS rather than having to then import Client Go as you would in, uh, in Cube Builder. So let's actually look at some, some differences between these. So this, these are two projects I, I've, I wrote. Um, one is the open feature operator on the left, and the other is um, a topology um, operator that effectively looks at the nodes and catalogs them in your cluster. 
You can see that with Cube Builder, we have an enormous amount of files that are generated. Uh, and then inside those files, you have struts. And these struts, as you can see, can be uh, serialized, deserialized into JSON format and sent over the wire. None of that's required in CubeRS because of the way that the derive macros work by implementing traits. I'm not going to go too much into that, but traits are a very powerful construct and concept within Rust. And ensuring that these structs have these additional traits means that it cuts down enormously on the amount of boilerplate that you have to do. So within this single slide, you can see there's a, a huge day and, day and night difference in the amount of code you actually have to produce and manage on a day to day. In this second slide, this is a little bit more nascent, so I'll just explain it. I, I don't expect you to be able to see this too well and, and to understand it. But what I'm trying to illustrate is that concurrency in Rust um, works very well for operators in the sense that you have the idea of um, using popular frameworks such as Tokyo that allow you to do asynchronous operations safely, where you have awaits, you have futures, you have the ability to pass data with locks. In Cube Builder, doing something where you can work with something in a different thread, you're passing it through, you have to write the implementation of locking, you have to deal with a worker thread pool, you're kind of on your own. Whereas, as I say, in Cube Builder, um, in Cube RS, this is very much not an option, and you have to be very definitive in the behaviors uh, across threads. And lastly, I mentioned earlier that make files and uh, customize and other tooling is going to be your bread and butter if you're using uh, Cube Builder. This is a, a real file from one of the, as I say, the operator that I helped to run and build. It's a bit of a nightmare. Whereas in Cube RS, you can codify everything, right? I don't mean that facetiously, you can. So you can actually cargo run, you can make sure with a function, you've programmatically installed the resources and the resources are installing as structs, right? So it's, it's converting those. It's not actually having to create YAML and then applying the YAML. Um, you could argue that they're doing the same thing. They are, right? Builder under the hood is creating YAML and then it's using Cube API to read the YAML back into it. CubeRS is just sidestepping that by going straight from taking a strut, converting it into something that the open API of Kubernetes can understand and applying it. But the, the illustrative point here is that you are simplifying this immensely. So it's not a silver bullet, right? I'm not saying that it's one thing better than the other, but with the safety of Rust, with the ability to reduce the amount of code you're managing, with the ability to also operationally decrease the amount of steps, it's certainly compelling, especially when operators are mission critical. But what does the future really hold? There's more and more adoption of Rust, right? So more libraries are out there every single day. We're also seeing that system programming is being brought into the cloud. So with distributed systems, for example, distributed storage being brought to Kubernetes, we need to have super reliable, super resilient um, languages, not only at the operator point, but also in the workloads themselves. And Rust fits really well. Rust forces you to think about your failure modes, right? You can't leave things to be ambiguous or to just have an exception being thrown. And more core workloads are moving to Rust because of this. I hope you've joined this talk. I really enjoyed giving it to you. Please do reach out for more questions and I look forward to your feedback. Thanks again.